This lecture from History 122, World Civilizations from 1600, is Section 9, Nationalism, Revolution, and Dictatorship. I think this section tends to be one of the hardest for students, and that's for several reasons. First, there is a lot of material. We're going to be talking about multiple different countries uh, that we have talked about before, and we're going to try and trace uh, their history from when we last spoke about them until the period just before World War II. So there's just a lot of information. There's a lot of different countries. So we kind of jump around a bit. And also this is history that a lot, there's a good chance that you may not be familiar with. And that makes things a little bit more difficult, right? You know, if you take a U.S. history course and they talk about George Washington, I mean, of course you've, you've studied George Washington or Abraham Lincoln uh, and so forth. But this, core, this uh, section will likely introduce some people and some history you might never have heard of before. But the reverse of that, Right, the, the other side of the coin, in a sense, is this also, I think, tends to be one of the most interesting sections. I think students often are very interested in this because it's stuff you maybe have not heard before. Right, So just keep that in mind. I think this is one you want to give extra attention to, both because it's difficult, but also because it's interesting. And I think if you give yourself that extra attention, uh, it will make for a more interesting lecture. So our objectives here is we're going to try and understand how the rest of the world try to deal with the forces unleashed by World War I and the Great Depression. In the last section, we, we focused mostly on how the United States dealt with uh, the forces unleashed by the Great Depression. We talked a little bit about Britain and France and Germany as well, but the focus was on the West, particularly the United States. Now we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about areas outside of the, the so-called West. We will also uh, try and understand how these different people tried to figure out what it meant to be modern, right? So there's all these... Um, different definitions for what it means to be modern. For this class, I mean the four revolutions, right? The economic, political, scientific, and industrial revolutions, right? A modern country has undertaken those four revolutions. And a lot of these countries in this time period, uh, from the late 19th to the early mid 20th century or so, about the first third of the 20th century, are asking, what does it mean to be modern? In particular, did they have to become modern like Western Europe and North America? Do they have to look to be modern? Do you have to look like Britain or France or the United States? And while there are some significant differences between those three countries, there's also some very strong similarities, such as ideas of constitutions, uh, liberalism, capitalism, and so forth. And so there's this basic question, do we have to become modern like Western Europe and North America? And the reason why you might not want to become modern like them is because of their problems. Right? Because Western Europe and North America have some serious issues. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the problems coming out of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we talked about the uh, Great Depression. And so some countries are wondering, maybe there's a way, another possible path towards national strength, towards independence, that will not bring the severe inequalities that we see in Western Europe and North America. Right? Do we have to become modern like these, these countries that have already become modern and just accept that we're going to have these social problems that they have, or can we try and make a new path to national strength? So could this new path in particular provide a better modernity than that given by capitalist liberal democracy? And so in this section, again, what makes things complicated is we're going to be looking at how different countries are going to experiment at times with other paths. So now we'll talk about Mexico. And one thing that I, I regret, I wish I had more time to give to Mexico and to Canada. Uh, sometimes people think of Canada as just a mini United States. I have to tell you that I received my PhD from the University of British Columbia, which is in Vancouver, Canada, and it's just not accurate. There's some similarities. There's also some significant differences. Uh, likewise, uh, even though Mexico is also a neighbor of the United States, a lot of times uh, American people do not necessarily know that much about Mexico. And I wish I had more time to talk a lot more about Mexico and about Canada, but I am going to at least talk about uh, Can or about Mexico in particular, right? We can at least give Mexico some time because we're trying to deal with this question of how people are trying to chart different paths towards modernity, towards those four revolutions. So remember, I differentiated between the Mexican War for Independence and the Mexican Revolution. Remember, the Mexican War for Independence did liberate Mexico from Spanish rule, which benefited in particular the Creoles. But of course, the Creoles, especially the elite Creoles, only form a minority of the population, right? Remember, in a lot of Latin American societies, you have a, a, a very wealthy class. Uh, these are typically Creoles. And then you have poor people 
um, down the line, and there tend to be a lot more of them. And key to this issue of wealth and poverty is land. Whoever has land tends to be wealthy. Whoever does not have land doesn't tend to have very much. So, and you may also recall we talked about how because you have these divisions within society, uh, both racial and economic, and remember those are connected, what develops in a lot of Latin American countries is a cadillo system. Remember, cadillos are these uh, dictators. Typically, they're creoles aligned with the military um, who use their authoritarian rule to hold society together. And they bring some state stability and also some economic development. But the one issue they face, uh, dictatorships, is that they also tend to be inflexible. It's very hard for them to change when necessary. And also, when, when something happens to a caudillo, it's not always clear who should take rule next, right? And some of them will stay in power for a very long time. And the problem is, you know, if you've been in power for several decades, uh, you tend to become inflexible. You tend not to be willing to change. Uh, you just want to keep doing what you were doing. And an example of that, is the last, in a sense, uh, Cadillo of the old period, before the Mexican Revolution, a man named Porfirio Diaz. Porfirio Diaz, and you can see him on the right. He will govern Mexico for more than 30 years in an increasingly dictatorial regime. Right, so Mexico will have a Cadillo, there will be some social instability, some economic instability, and that's kind of, there's a lid kept on it by this powerful Cadillo, Porfirio Diaz. Now, one thing I want to stress, he does, thanks to the ability to bring stability through this kind of uh, authoritarian rule, he does allow for some economic growth, right? So Mexico's economy will develop during this time period, but there are some problems with it. There is a lack of sharing in that economic growth. In other words, most of the benefits for economic growth go to a small group of wealthy Creoles, people who are already typically rich, uh, and not very much goes to the rest of the Mexican people. And of course, people complain about that. They're not particularly happy about that. But Diaz will use his uh, power, his authority as a cadillo, in order to keep control of things. So basically, he will increasingly restrict freedom because people are complaining that the economic divisions are growing larger and that the share, the increasing prosperity of Mexico is not being shared, right? So uh, this is a serious issue, right? We have, even though we have economic growth, it's not being distributed. So people are asking for more political power uh, and for, for that economic um, growth, uh, the, 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 the wealth that's coming out of the economic growth to be distributed, Diaz will resist that and will increasingly turn to authoritarian regimes to maintain his power and to maintain the economic and social order that benefits him and his class. There were people among the Creoles uh, who resisted uh, Porfirio Diaz, people who thought that he was wrong uh, and that Mexico needed to become a true democracy. And one of those was a man named Francisco Madero. And Francisco Madero uh, was a true liberal Democrat. And I don't mean a member, a member of the Democratic Party. I mean, he believed in things like a constitution, like the rule of law. He was generally more towards a, a capitalist perspective on things. But he was someone who wanted to make Mexico into a liberal democracy. Now, it's a, it's a very long story and it's a very fascinating story, but just for time, I, I can't really talk about it here. But basically, uh, Diaz had promised elections. Uh, Diaz had promised that there would be free and open elections. And um, on the theory that he would easily win them, Diaz was uh, wrong about how popular he was. Uh, remember, he, this guy had been in power for a very long time. I think people tended to tell him just what he wanted to hear. And so he was pretty confident that there was another election. He would easily win it. And so Francisco Madero, who was growing in popularity, is going to run in an election against Diaz. And people could tell from the polls that it looked like Francisco Madero would actually win. So Diaz, being a Cadillo, who didn't really believe in democracy, reacted by having Francisco Madero arrested. Right, so he's actually going to have Francisco Madero arrested. There's a very good chance that Madero would have been uh, executed. He probably would have been killed, but he was actually able to escape. And then he will help lead a revolution against Diaz in 1910. And this revolution does succeed in overthrowing Diaz. Now, Francisco Madero is the real deal. He really believes in liberal democracy. So he doesn't just say, okay, I won, you know, I defeated Diaz. Um, I'm president now. He will 
they will then instead actually have an election, right? They, they will actually go through and have an election and Francisco Madero will be elected president in 1911. And I want to stress again, Francisco Madero is the real deal. He believes in democracy and he wants, he's also a nationalist and he believes that he has to be the president for all Mexicans, not simply one group of Mexicans. He has to be the Mex the president for all of Mexico, uh, the entire Mexican people. So based on that desire to unite all Mexicans, based on his belief in liberal democracy, he tried to compromise with some former supporters of Diaz, including the military. What does that mean? Madero refused to fire the generals who had supported Diaz, right? He allowed Diaz's uh, supporters in the military to maintain their high posts as generals. So basically, the, um, the allies of the man he had helped overthrow and were still in power. And Madero, you know, I, like I said, I really respect the guy because he was really trying to be a president for all Mexicans. He really wanted to have compromise. Uh, but unfortunately for him, these generals, these uh, supporters of Diaz are not the kind of man, uh, Francisco kind of men Francisco Madero was. And they respond by his willingness to be conciliatory by his willingness to, um, try and compromise by launching a coup, arresting him, and then executing him. In 1913, uh, these generals who had been uh, supporters of Diaz, they uh, repay Madero's uh, liberalness. They repay his willingness to compromise, like I said, by uh, having a coup, overthrowing him, arresting him, and then assassinating him. They, they just flat out execute him. Now, you may have heard of Pancho Villa. And Pancho Villa is a fascinating character about which you could have a whole lecture, perhaps a whole class. But for now, what I want to say about Pancho Villa was that he was relatively radical, uh, a revolutionary who supported land reform to help the peasants, right? So Pancho Villa represented the poor of Mexico, typically the mestizos, people who had little or no land and who wanted, uh, who wanted land because it was all controlled. Most of it was controlled by the Creoles. Um, and he fights for their interests. So when you think Pancho Villa, think peasants, right? He's the one who's their friend, who supports them, and who wants land reform. He was also pro-Madero. And he had helped in Madero's revolution that toppled Diaz. And Pancho Villa was a very savvy politician. Uh, he understood politics well. He understood power well. And he told Madero, don't trust these generals. Don't trust these guys who used to support Diaz. They hate you. They will take power if they can. And unfortunately, Pancho Villa was correct, right? Pancho Villa was correct. Now, once this happens, once Madero is assassinated, Pancho Villa and other Mexicans will rise up in rebellion. And this will continue then the Mexican Revolution. It could have stopped right there in 1911 with the election of um, Madero, but it's actually going to continue now. There's going to be more fighting because no, uh, these Mexicans who had overthrown Diaz uh, don't want another Diaz, right? They want something else. Uh, and what's tricky is that lots of Mexicans want lots of different things. But like I said, Pancho Villa, he's the one who's thinking mostly of the peasants. So the revolution fighting will break out again. Uh, and Pancho Villa is a complex guy because he, in many ways, he is a Robin Hood figure who is going to uh, make sure that to take care of the poor, to look to the interests of the poor, while also fighting against dictatorship. But he could also be extraordinarily brutal. He could uh, he killed a lot of people, including people who had surrendered at times. What's really fascinating, too, about him is he was an expert at using the increasing popular culture. For instance, uh, by this time, movies were fairly widespread. Like, you could go to a movie theater and watch a movie. It's probably not going to have sound, but you could go there and watch one. And these were very popular. And so Pancho Villa actually made a deal with an American film company to, like, film him fighting and uh, they made a movie about this guy. And unfortunately, the movie, except I think for a few excerpts, has been lost. And they even gave him a uniform they want him to wear uh, during uh, when he was fighting in order to, uh, to, to kind of look more dashing and to increase sales. And this was really brilliant by Pancho Villa because, A, it familiarized Americans with him and presented him in a heroic light as someone fighting for liberty and freedom against dictatorship. So that led a lot of Americans to support him. And that was important because then Americans were able to sell guns to him. And if you want to have a revolution, having guns is pretty good. And so the United States was able to become a supplier of weapons and ammunition to Via in this early period. In addition, 
uh, Pancho Villa was very savvy and made sure that he got a, a cut of all the ticket sales. So he made a lot of money off this, which he could use to buy the guns. So I want to, to my key to talking about Pancho Villa here, what I want to stress in particular is that the Mexican Revolution is many different things. There's many Mexicans who are rising up for very different things. So Pancho Villa, for example, is a revolutionary who's fighting to help the peasants. His, his primary concern is, is rural, countryside, land reform, interests of the peasants. Now, the rev- and it's one thing that's tricky about the Mexican Revolution, it's hard to find a year to stop it. 1920 is kind of considered a, a normal year to stop it. Um, but we're going to kind of keep going here in this time period. Um, but eventually what happens is a new government is set up in 1917. Right? They eventually do get rid of the generals and they set up a new revolutionary government. So in a sense, by 1917, it would seem that Pancho Villa and the other revolutionaries have triumphed. Right, The people who were against Diaz's generals, the guys who seized power. It looks like in 1917, the revolutionaries are triumphant. However, they all want different things. So this new government that's set up is not interested in radical land reform, what Pancho Villa was, was fighting for. It wants radical modernization focused on the middle and upper classes, and that typically means focusing on the cities, right? So they want to undertake radical modernizing reform, like I said, focused on the middle and upper classes rather than on the poor. So there is in this Mexican Revolution a lot of division over what Mexico should be like, where the priorities should be, right? Villa represents the agricultural priorities. This new group, um, or the group, I'm sorry, that takes control of the new government they want this radical modernization focused on the middle and upper classes. And that's in part why Pancho Villa will eventually be assassinated uh, by government supporters. And so now you have this new government in power that is not interested so much in the interests of the peasants, but focusing on the middle and upper classes and on mo- radical modernization. And one question they had was, what do we do about religion? Uh, and by religion, of course, we mean Catholicism, something like 95% of Mexicans were Catholic, and it's still something like 90%. So Mexico is very much a very deeply Catholic country. So there's this question, uh, what do you do about religion, especially when it was connected to the old order, right? Typically, the Catholic Church in Mexico was a force that was against revolution in some important ways, at least officially. It's complex because you you did have people like Padre Hidalgo, who were Catholic priests, rising up and leading revolutions. And he wasn't the only Catholic priest to lead a revolution. But at least in terms of how it worked as an institution, the Catholic Church in Mexico traditionally was connected to the old order, to the Cadillos, and so forth, because the Catholic Church was primarily interested in maintaining stability. In addition, and of course that was the old order that the uh, this new government was wanting to distance itself from, and it saw this new order as a problem, and Catholic, the Catholic Church was connected to that, that old order. In addition, Catholicism to these reformers seemed superstitious. Uh, this was a time period in which it was often emphasized by uh, radicals, uh, political r- radicals in particular, that religion was superstitious and was an enemy to modernization. So that in order for uh, a country to become modernized, they needed to become scientific, which meant getting rid of religion, which was inherently superstitious. So it's interesting. You have this country that is is very highly Catholic, that has a government that has come to power, which ends up being very anti-Catholic. And you can see this in this, uh, what's called in the 1917 constitution. Usually I don't want you to remember years, but this is actually called by historians, the 1917 constitution. So you do need to know that year. And in this constitution, this does numerous things. Uh, one thing it does is it forbids public worship. And that might be if, especially if you, if you, if you're not from religious background, or if you're from a Protestant Christian background, uh, Catholics have a, uh, tradition of worshiping outside the church. For example, uh, they would have processions, which are just like basically religious uh, parades. And these could be quite long, uh, large uh, festivals. It could go on for quite some time. Uh, That is now made illegal. Uh, Priests and nuns, of course, wear special clothing. The 1917 Constitution barred them from wearing religious clothing outside of churches. So you could dress like a priest or a nun if you were in a church. But if you were outside a church, you could not. Uh, Churches cannot own anything other than the church building in terms of property. So you could not, for example, have a religious school, right? A church could not own a school building. 
And if you attend church and you you know that you, your church may have like a uh, a church like that you actually worship in, and then you may have a separate hall where like you have meetings and things like that, that would be illegal according to this constitution. And certainly they didn't want um, religious schools. And this constitution eventually barred them. They didn't want people learning so-called superstitions. In addition, if you were a uh, member of the clergy, if you were a priest, you could not vote or even comment on political affairs. So this is kind of a striking constitution, right? If, if you're coming from the, an American perspective, right, our constitution emphasizes freedom of religion. But this constitution is focusing on controlling religion, particularly Catholicism, and limiting its influence. And of course, Catholics were very unhappy with this. A lot of Catholics really opposed this. They tried to deal protest against this peacefully. However, they will eventually, because the government refuses to change, there will be a Christian rebellion, a uh, Catholic rebellion called the Cristero War. Um, Cristero is means that means like a follower of Christ. Cristero would mean follower of Christ. And so these are, and this is an image here of Cristero rebels. They will rise up in rebellion against the government. And they're famous for their battle cry, uh, Viva Cristo Rey, which is a uh, hurrah for Christ the King. But they will rise up in rebellion. Now, their rebellion, however, will in the end be crushed by this new government. So the Cristeros will be put down. And to give you an idea of how serious this was, this is a Mexican priest by the name of Miguel Pro. You can see he is wearing a um, suit. He's not dressed as a priest right? Uh, that was, of course, illegal to be dressed like a priest. And he was accused falsely of being part of a bomb plot against the government. He was accused of plotting to, to hurt government officials. And so he is being uh, executed. And what's shocking is the government actually like took pictures of his execution. So there he is on the left praying before his execution. There he is on the right uh, holding his arms out to be executed. And there he is after the uh, he has been shot and they're getting ready to uh, shoot him in the head in order to make sure that he is indeed deceased. Uh, so this is pretty serious, right? This priest actually was not up to any kind of uh, violent political activity, but he is basically framed and uh, arrested and executed. And this is pretty shocking, right? We can see how these uh, this, in a sense, persecution of religion has led to a lot of violence, right? And... Uh, it's kind of sh shocking that we see this, but this is something we see throughout the 20th century. So we need to understand why it happened. And, th and this is kind of tricky. You can understand why something happened and still think it's wrong. Uh, that's one thing I want to emphasize, right? If you believe in freedom of religion, this is really weird. Um, but we need to understand why a government may decide not to enforce freedom of religion. So like I said before, the Catholic Church was aligned with the old regime, the regime that the new government thought was really bad, was really terrible, and that they needed to get away from. They needed to get away from those policies. So, you know, the Catholic Church, it was, you know, they didn't really trust it. They thought it could be dangerous to them. It may want to turn back the clock and make things were uh, like they used to be. In addition, there was this belief that religion, which they used interchangeably basically with superstition, was an enemy of progress towards modernity right? They saw the Catholic Church as opposing the four revolutions that we talked about, and so they wanted to limit its power. And so it's striking then, here though, the Mexican government is going to choose authoritarian politics over liberalism, right? Remember in this section, we have this kind of basic question, how do we, um, of how countries are going to try and become modern, often in ways outside of what, what maybe is being done in the United States or Great Britain, uh, Mexico is actually following a policy similar to what happened in France. It's just a bit more violent if we're thinking of the, the later 19th century. So in Mexico, they're not going to choose liberalism. They're going to choose authoritarian politics in part because liberalism, because it emphasizes rights, would increase the power of religion, which they see as the enemy. And so it's really striking here. Uh, for the Americans, especially when you include the Bill of Rights, we think of the Constitution as existing to uh, give people freedom to limit the power of the government. But the goal of the Mexican government here is not to limit the power of the government to protect citizens. The goal is to increase the power of the government in order to modernize, right? To increase the power of the government in order to modernize. So in a sense, uh, things are not going well in Mexico, right? We've had um, a revolution that overthrow Diaz. 
Uh, then Madero is elected, then he is uh, overthrown and then assassinated, and then you've got this new government that is provoking rebellions by being anti-Catholic. This is not a good situation. This is this is uh, this political instability is leading a lot of people to die, and of course it's not good for the economy, right? During this time period in Mexico, you've got wars constantly being fought by different groups, uh, plantations, uh, haciendas, farms are ravaged, uh, factories are destroyed. This is not good for Mexico's economy. So how will, will Mexican, the, the Mexican government bring stability and economic development? Be, uh, how do they do this? Well, in a sense, what's going to happen is a political party will rise to power and will actually control Mexico for several decades. And this party is called the Industrial Revolutionary Party. And I, I think that's a very interesting name because they're emphasizing that they're dedicated to revolution, to making massive changes but they're going to be focused in many ways on industry, on modernizing the country. So one thing that's going to happen that brings stability is that you're going to have the same group of people ruling Mexico for several decades, right? This Industrial Revolutionary Party will be in charge, will be essentially ruling Mexico as a one-party uh, government. This Industrial Revolutionary Party realizes that it doesn't really make sense to put so much pressure on Catholics, especially when they make up 90-95% of the population, so it will back off on the anti-Catholic legislation. They don't really get rid of it. Uh, I believe most of those anti-Catholic um, parts of the Constitution that we just discussed are still part of the Mexican Constitution. They just aren't enforced, right? So they're going to back off on that. That helps uh, make this into a regime that Catholics can support. And one of the people who was the key like founder and early leader of the Industrial Revolutionary Party is a man named Lazara Cardenas, and he's a very important person. So I need to talk a little bit about him and how he is going to help develop uh, Mexico uh, economically and help bring stability. So remember, a lot of the instability had to do with the fact that there wasn't uh, land reform, that land was unevenly distributed. Uh, Lazara Cardenas is not a liberal. He does not make the same uh, emphasis on property rights that liberals do. Remember uh, John Locke and liberalism, you had this idea that the holding of property is tied to political power. And so there's this kind of belief that if you take away or force someone to sell their property, um, then that reduces their political power. Liberals don't like that. Lazar Cardenas would actually force people uh, to sell land to engage in a kind of land reform. So people who had a whole bunch of land were forced to get rid of it, to sell it. And this allowed poor people to be able to buy it. So they're going to undergo an actual land reform. It maybe isn't as radical as some people would like, but the key thing here is that you're actually going to have land reform. Remember, a lot of the instability was because land was unevenly distributed. Some people had s s huge amounts of land. Some people had very little or none. And now the uh, it's going to be more equitably distributed. Uh, and so more people are like, okay, we can live with this. You know, we've got enough land to survive or to even prosper. This is good. We accept this. So that, even though that's a challenge to property rights, it does help bring stability. One other thing that he does that's fascinating, uh, and this shows that, again, my remember there's this overall point we're trying to make in this section of how people are going to try different routes to modernity. They're going to do something different from like the United States or from Britain or France. And one thing about Lazaro Cardenas that's important is that he was a socialist which you can kind of get a sense from because we already mentioned how he was willing to challenge property rights in regards to land reform, but he was a socialist. So and during this time period, Mexico had a lot of oil, still has a lot of oil. But during this time period, the oil was basically controlled by the United States. Uh, the Americans in particular controlled the refining of oil and made a, a bunch of money off of that. So this was not a good situation from the perspective of the Mexicans because an important part of their economy, absolutely vital to the Industrial Revolution, was controlled essentially by foreigners, by Americans. And what will end up happening is there's a dispute between oil companies and Mexican workers. And the uh, both sides, uh, basically the Mexican workers are, are striking. Both sides agree to arbitration, uh, a kind of compromise solution worked out by an outside group. Um, but the, uh, that group finds in favor of the workers and the American oil companies say, we're not going to abide by this. Uh, we reject this deal. We don't think it's a good deal. And so Lazar Cardenas will say, okay, if you will not treat Mexican workers in a way that we think is right and just, we're going to nationalize oil. We're going to nationalize the oil companies. Now you may ask, what does nationalization mean? It means when you force uh, or nationalization basically means when a government takes over a business, 
right? Nationalization is when a government takes over a business. So you had all these American oil companies that, that controlled basically the Mexican oil industry, especially refining. And Lazar Cardenas says, okay, all you guys, you're selling out to the government. He didn't just, he didn't really, he, it's not like he stole the oil companies, but he did force them to sell. He did force them to sell. So he forced all the Americans uh, to sell their oil companies in Mexico. And then the Mexican government controlled the oil, right? So that's a kind of socialism, right? You have joint communal ownership of the oil companies. And the idea then is that he could use the oil to do things like fund schools and fund the government and so forth, right? You make sure that the product, the idea, it's not always works and in, in, doesn't always work in practice, but the idea is that, you know, if the government owns the oil, then we're operating it not to make just individuals wealthy, but to make all of our Mexican society, our Mexican nation wealthy. And what's important also about Lazaro Cardenas is that he would peacefully transition out of power to be succeeded by someone from the same party. So this is very important. Uh, one thing about when you're a Cadillo, it's hard to stop being a Cadillo. Cadillos will typically rule until they're overthrown or until they die. Uh, they basically just want to stay in power forever. And that's kind of a problem uh, because sometimes you have a guy that doesn't know what they're doing in charge or they get they get senile or they get sick and or, or something. So what happens is he will transition out of power with a successor from the same party that gives stability. It gives you the stability of the Cadillos because you still have the same group of people in power who are following, who have the basic same kind of ideas. But at the same time, you have a kind of flexibility because if you have a, a guy who's just doing a terrible job, you can remove him peacefully through elections within the party and then have someone else who's more competent take over. So what in a sense that the Industrial Revolutionary Party does is it gives the best of both worlds, right? It gives you uh, a kind of stability that the Cadillos gave while also get, making a way to peacefully transition out of power, as you would see in a democracy. Now, Mexico, and during this time period, we can't say it's a true democracy. The um, Industrial Revolutionary Party will use coercion uh, to make it so that other political parties can't uh, really form and, and su successfully challenge it for several decades. However, during this time period, most Mexicans are just fine with that. Right, the limited freedom and the economic development that they will enjoy under the stability brought by the uh, Industrial Revolutionary Party and people like Lazaro Cardenas will bring uh, economic uh, development and stability. Right, so there's just enough freedom and just enough economic development that people are happy. They won't rebel against the government. They will accept the government rule, and so you have stability, which of course encourages economic development. It's kind of complex because economic development helps bring stability, while stability helps bring economic development. They, they have that kind of relationship. And just to give you a statistic, between 1940 and 1970, the uh, per capita GDP tripled. So Mexicans are becoming wealthier under this system. So this works pretty well. Uh, again, this is not, uh, this certainly isn't communism, it's, but it's not American style liberalism, right? Mexicans are charting their own path towards modernity that makes sense based on the historical context that they are in, right? They're kind of developing their own model, their own way forward. 